Hey everybody, we are Martin, Robert, and Francis, and this is Snakes and Otters, a pointless discussion of eternal questions. Get ready, we're about to live in your head rent-free. Hey everybody, welcome back to Snakes and Otters. This is episode 63. I am Martin. I'm Robert. And I'm Francis. So tonight, guys, is the fourth and final episode of our Civil War series. Um, it is going to be called The Key is in Our Pocket, The Siege of Vicksburg. And, of course, that title you know, refers to um, Lincoln viewing the Mississippi uh, and its capture as the key to the whole war. And after Grant's uh, victory at Vicksburg, the key was in their pocket. And this is the culmination of our series um, of going through the big battles of late 62 through 63, starting with Fredericksburg, then on to uh, Chancellorsville, Gettysburg, and finally Vicksburg. So, you guys, any, anything initial before I kind of sort of launch into this a little bit? I think no. you're doing beautifully. <laughs> I just want to throw some. Uh, so my experience with Vicksburg uh, started with uh, the the great writer Shelby Foyt. Uh, he had uh, written, of course, the Civil War series, the three volume set, and many, many, many moons ago, uh, Francis had given me a uh, small book by Shelby Foyt, which actually turns out it was a uh, segment of the three volume set. It was on the Battle of Vicksburg. And, you know, Shelby Foote, he's an interesting historian. He's not, um, I mean, he's a true historian, but he's not what we would call rigid in his, uh, in his writing by today's standards. Uh, not, not exactly a lot of footnotes and things like that. Uh, but it's an engaging read. And that's the important thing. Yeah. It was a narrative, if I remember right. Yeah, yeah it's very much a narrative, which is great because, to me, that's the best way to tell, tell a story. Um, but I was fascinated by the story because he does such a great job of laying out uh, all the different players in the story, whether it's Grant or Sherman or the, the Confederate commander and, and all of the, the people on both sides, uh, especially uh, that, that trench warfare, this really this early version of trench warfare that goes on. It was a really fascinating read. I highly recommend anything by him, uh, but especially that book. And I want to say it was The Stars in Our Courses, but I'd have to look. That's, that is correct. That, it, was mostly about Get, it was mostly about Gettysburg, if I recall correctly. But no, no, were, I think this is mostly uh, Vicksburg. I was say, he's done several, but they're all excerpts from uh, the, the Master Three Volume set that he did. Uh, yeah. He was one of the main speakers, if you could consider anybody a main speaker, of Ken Burns' Civil War series. Uh, when you could see him uh, it, with that wonderful southern drawl of his, because he's definitely from the deep south. Uh, yeah, you, he's uh, very much his. a, um, uh, yes, there, there is a nice picture of him. Obviously, listeners can't see it, but uh, um, yeah, he, 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 he is a great ago. historian. He's not a pro-South or pro-North. He's just telling the story and very much telling it from the perspective of people, uh, which is, to me, what makes a great historian for mass consumption. Right. I have a version of his book uh, on Shiloh. Uh, leather bound, actually, and it, it's also an, ama an amazing read. Uh, it, he he covers everything, and he's in many respects he's kind of our muse uh, on a lot of this, yeah. uh, in many ways. Uh, and I, I think he uh, he's well worth. The book has sold a gazillion copies, so it's not like you can't yeah. find copies of the three volume set or the, the excerpt versions that he has out there. Uh, and, but you're right; he kind of puts his hooks in you very much. And Vicksburg is something that to me is like you said martin it's 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 the key it's everything if you had to put gettys when when you juxtapose gettysburg to vicksburg gettysburg you kind of kind of go like huh why why did that have to happen yes we've studied that we know all that sort of stuff but nothing was really gained by gettysburg but vicksburg well, well yeah i know it wasn't, I, I, an it wasn't an intentional campaign from the northern side Correct. Uh, which is what Vicksburg was. It was the culmination of nearly two years of war. Yeah. And so that was Grant's. It was, it was strategy. 
It was, we will win the war by putting this key yeah. in our pocket. And ultimately it did, although not just for itself, because yeah. in many respects it brings Grant into ascendancy, but that's a longer discussion. Yeah. Martin? Well, Robert, you're, you're exactly right. That's the, the exact right way to, to go into a study of Vicksburg, is understanding that it's a campaign. And it's a key campaign because of what became known as the Anaconda Plan. And that's the real key to understanding what's going on here with Vicksburg. And, and listeners, you know, this was, I think, going to be more of a kind of a straight history lesson for you uh, when we talk about Vicksburg as, as compared well, to our... Fun. Yes, as, fun. as compared to our, our, our study of uh, Gettysburg, you know, because Gettysburg, we did a what if, guys. You know, and yeah, that's always about, freewheeling. Yeah. yeah, such a freewheeling thing. We talked about Jackson and you know, Jackson's alive, does the whole thing even happen, and all that stuff. There's nothing like that with Vicksburg, really. Vicksburg is is the culmination, as Robert said, of this campaign in the West, in the Western theater. You know, and Gettysburg's important because it's really the first clear-cut, big-time Union victory, the first real humbling of Robert E. Lee. But in the West, the Union Army has, regu- has a pretty good record of victory. Uh, and most of those victories authored by Ulysses S. Grant. Exactly. Yes, in fact, you could even make the claim they don't have any victories except Grant's in the yes. West. And, and that's, you know, Grant, uh, we've talked about him a great deal. Again, he's, he's a hero of ours, um, somebody we... You could say his presidency is a failure uh, to a degree, but at the same time, he was he was a man who stood for kind of that freedom from sea to shining sea ideal. Well, heroes come in the in the form of the person, not in the form of their accomplishments, and I've yeah. always believed that. Yeah. Uh, and Grant stands on his own record very well, yeah. uh, not as a leader. I mean, that's to me, that's what makes him so heroic, and it's nowhere more evident than it is in Vicksburg. It's not just the tactics. It is the tactics, of course, but the operational genius that he has, uh, that he lays out you know, flawlessly in many respects in hindsight, but there was almost no way he could have won this. Uh, with conventional thinking. Yeah, that's that's very true. He also benefited from what is really, uh, I think, two very lucky things. Uh, And the first was, being so far away from Washington, (laughs) the bureaucrats didn't get to meddle with what he was doing. It was much easier to ignore uh, anything that they were telling him to do. If he didn't want to do it, he didn't have to. Yeah, once Halleck is removed, uh, he had a little bit of a problem when Halleck was on yeah. site. But yeah. once that happened, then, you know, set that baby on warp drive because we're moving forward. And exactly. The other thing that, that was really uh, beneficial to him, and it's, it's, it's strictly dumb luck, because this is the sort of thing that is uh, all the great what-ifs turn on, and that is Sidney Albert Johnston dying at Shiloh. Yeah. He was considered the top general going into the war command of the Union armies was offered to him before he resigned his commission. You know, he was considered the guy, and he ended up on the South, like many of the, the recognized... Same, same level as Lee, yeah. Albert right. was thought of the same level as Lee was. Exactly. Uh, he certainly had fact, the experience, Lee yes. was the second choice behind Sidney Albert Johnson. So, I mean, that tells you how good this guy was. And uh, the fact that, that he's out there and dies from what is just an incredibly lucky shot. He gets shot in the leg, his femoral artery is severed, and he dies on the battlefield within minutes because, you know, there's no way to stop that. And that was another bit of dumb luck for for Grant. But, you know, if you don't have a a lot of dumb luck going with you, you're not going to win the battles anyway. But he had that benefit of not having to face anybody near anywhere near his own caliber until he goes east to fight Lee. And yeah. At that point, it's too late for Lee. He doesn't have the resources. Yeah. But, I, you know, Grant, we've talked about a great deal in, in Hero. And, but like you said, Francis, there are, there are people meddling. Um, 
he finally overcomes a lot of that. Of course, the accusations of being a drunk and, and an alcoholic and uh, Halleck meddling with him. But eventually he overcomes all that and he has Lincoln's backing. You know, Lincoln famously says, I can't spare this man. He fights. Yeah, that was after Shiloh, which uh, he, was, he was the hero, you know, unconditional surrender Grant from Donaldson going into that. And all of a sudden he goes, what? You lost, there were 30,000 men killed in two days, uh, which was an, an unbelievably bloody battle. In many respects, Shiloh was, not, not to go off on a tangent or anything, but Shiloh was what changed the character of the war. Mm -hmm. Because people, the, the Union, before that, it was the same mindset that they had at the Battle of the uh, First Bull Run. Oh, let's go out and have our picnics and watch us go kick some Confederate ass. And they realized. Well, and it was also that yeah. mindset that you know, one one good battle and we're done. That's exactly yeah. it. And yeah. they didn't. The resolve the of, the, of the Confederacy was totally underestimated. Uh, Shiloh changed a lot of that. Yeah, uh, yeah. it wasn't the and only it's thing. Interesting because you know he was losing at Shiloh. Mm -hmm. On the first day. That's right. And oh. there's that great exchange between him and Sherman. Oh yes, well, it's probably Sherman one of my talks about books. how they were got their butts kicked, and and you know Grant says, you know, whoop them tomorrow though. That's see, that's quintessential Grant. That's exactly yeah. right. Nobody yeah. else would have done that. That nobody, yeah. everybody else would everybody have, just, else would have you know, just gone home. They would have retreated and left the battlefield to the Confederates. Yeah. Right. And that that, that, that was Grant's quality genius. of Grant, and Pardon? that's that bulldog quality. Bulldog. Where he yeah. just doesn't let go. And that's evident in this campaign as well. But the the it's a key part of the Anaconda plan and listeners we just what that means is the Union strategy was to blockade all the southern ports. I mean, from Norfolk to New Orleans. Thousands of miles of Confederate coastline had to be blockaded. Then ground operations in the east and the west, and then the key being if we can capture and control the entirety of the Mississippi, then we split the Confederacy in two. And that's why strategically Vicksburg is so much more important than, say, Gettysburg. Again, Gettysburg important because it's a clear-cut Union win. It's a clear-cut humiliation of Robert E. Lee Confederate forces have to go back to Virginia. It, it's going to confine the war now to Virginia. It's not going to spread to Pennsylvania. It's not going to spread again to Maryland. But cutting the Confederacy in two is so important. Um, to a large degree, Texas, you know, guys, was kind of the breadbasket of the Confederacy. It was you know, essentially untouched by the war, too. Certainly there were no yeah. major campaigns there. Uh, it, was, it was vast. And yeah. well, it was also the economic lifeline because uh, foreign powers could get goods into Mexico and they could then come up north through Me uh, through Texas. Right. And yeah. And that's how the blockade could be avoided because you, you can well they could do the best they could to blockade those thousands of miles of coastlines, but really what they blockaded were the major ports. Mm -hmm. uh, right. You can't really you couldn't blockade that much coastline. Uh, it'd be difficult to do today, much less 150 years ago. Uh, but yeah, you can't do that and do Mexico. So that's where a lot of the stuff came through. And once that's cut off, then they're really going to be hurting. Yeah, and Vicksburg was the, was, the, was the pinch point. It was the hub point. Everything was well, crossing the Mississippi through there. Well, it was the last point. At the, it was the last. 1863, yeah. It, yeah, it's the last one that was left. <laughs> right. uh, and Memphis it is gone. On and, some uh, heights overlooking yep. the Mississippi, so it commands a broad stretch of the river. Yes, that's very and important. That's very yeah, important. That's correct. And that's why it was so hard to take. Yes, that is exactly true. So, you, you know, but the thing is, you've got the, uh, the, the ships, the, the riverboats, and, and troops wanting to come down from the north and to meet up with Grant and his, his forces coming up from the south, and they're trying to converge there, and really, once they get to that point, ultimately, it's a foregone conclusion but it's still a long, hard road to get there. Because once yeah. Vicksburg is surrounded, there's nothing to do. Because nobody's coming to their, their, uh, to their aid. Well, there is no saving Vicksburg. 
I'm glad you mentioned that because that was another piece of this that was Grant's genius. And I know we're going to talk a little bit about his running the blockade uh, in, in April, April 16th. Yeah. And that's its own beautiful story. But to, to jump just ahead a little bit, we have to understand this is another of Grant's genius. When, that, when he gets his men past Vicksburg and he crosses lower down into the dry land, he begins an overland campaign, he does not go and surround Vicksburg. He goes, cuts off their supply lines, mm -hmm. turns around, and beats the snot out of Joe Johnston in Jackson. So that way, which he didn't have to do. In fact, conventional wisdom said, no, why would you do that? Your objective is Vicksburg. He makes certain that he cannot be attacked from behind with any real uh, mm -hmm. reliability. Then he right. turns... And even, even Joe Johnston is not a general you want in your rear causing you havoc when you're on foreign soil, which essentially exactly. was enemy territory. And this, was a, this was Grant, the strategist, the brilliant guy. He says, you know, I cannot leave the enemy behind me. So that's why he, he, and he's very much like Napoleon. He knows he can whip any two armies. He just can't do it at the same time. Right. And, and that's what basically he does that. He whips Johnston, turns around. Pemberton finally gets the message, and I can't say I blame him for staying put because that was the point, was to defend Vicksburg. Finally, he realizes, well, shit, Grant's coming. They meet at Champion Hill, and yeah, Pemberton, they were evenly matched. Pemberton perhaps could have uh, made, uh, if, if he'd have had a rousing victory there, but he's against Grant. Uh, Grant is able to interpret uh, his this is one of those moments we talk a lot about during his episode about how he takes the plans that he has and throws them out the window when reality doesn't match up to them. Uh, Champion Hill's the perfect no example. No plan survives that. contact with the enemy. That's exactly <laughs> right. And Champion Hill's the perfect one because Pemberton does not do what he expects, and Sherman is actually in in desperate issues at some point. So he has to basically bring forth his men, reallocate them on the fly. To, to win the battle. Now, once that happens, you're right. It's a, it's a fait accompli because yeah. he, he's, a, he's around Vicksburg and, and he brings Pemberton his big guns. Did make the mis he, he, one of his major mistakes, one was fighting Grant to begin with, obviously. Uh, but yeah. one of his strategic uh, mistakes, whether it's his mistake or was imposed upon him because Johnson outranks him. Right. Uh, and that is relying on Johnson because remember, there's, there's a scene in Shelby Foote's book. Uh, that covers this, uh, where Pemberton and, and Johnson meet up after uh, Vicksburg has fallen, because I think uh, Pemberton is paroled, right, uh, or he yes. escapes. I forget which. Uh, that they uh, that's part of the deal. Uh, everybody, yeah, everybody paroled. was paroled right. without their slaves. That was Grant's well, yeah. only condition. Uh, but they wanted them. But he meets up happen. with Johnston afterwards, and you get the impression that you know if, if it would have probably meant his own life, he probably would have taken a sword and skewered the man. Because I think he thought Johnston was going to come to his aid. Uh, well, sure. He was the only commanding force within range, you would think. Now, I'm not sure if Pemberton knew that Grant had already beaten the snot out of Johnston before. But he still had a force. It's he not still like had a force. That's correct. Uh, and and he, I, I think Johnston knew what was going on, but just chose not to help. Johnston was old school. He was one of the poster boys for old school, and, ba and it was the same failing that the Union generals would have. They'd get their nose bloodied and their ass kicked, and they'd go back and they'd cry for a little while. And Grant knew this. He knew that all you have to do is whip them, and they're out of action. They will not come back, not immediately, right. that, which is that's what he does. He Even when he gets you know, smacked like he did at Shiloh, whip them tomorrow. He's back at it again. Yeah. Nobody else does that other than him and Sherman, who he teaches. Uh, and Thomas, who eventually, which, you know, that's something else, uh, but he, Thomas already had the grit, uh, but he learned that from Grant at Chattanooga, which is, takes place after this. Uh, in fact, everybody eventually learns to fight like Grant on the Union side. Well, they have to. Well, exactly. It's even bigger than that. Uh, World War One and World War Two were fought like Grant. Uh, that's he. He was that formative on the on the military sense. Uh, and I think I've talked to you about Russell Wigley's book several times, The American Way of War. It is essentially Grant. Uh, right. Well, before, he's the first was, one to really have right. that continuous warfare. That is correct. Um, and and uh, we don't see it as much in the the West because the the forces there are not as big or as uh, well trained or as concentrated. Uh, but when he goes east and the theater becomes much smaller, because yeah. it's all centered around Richmond and Lee's army, uh, you know they don't get a chance to catch the breath, which is brilliant. Yeah. 
which is so much so, and I don't know if any of, if our, any of our listeners have caught, as we're recording this, the recent History Channel three-part series on Grant. Uh, I totally recommend it. The second episode is mostly Vicksburg. If you really want to see what Vicksburg is, it's well worth the time to watch that. Mm-hmm. And the third episode basically is the, is the wilderness, uh, and from there forward, and it talks about the fact that anybody else would have gone in gotten their butts kicked, which Grant did at the wilderness. Multiple times. Multiple times. And he turns, the whatever, when everybody knew the boss had finally arrived, is when they were marching away from the wilderness, they turned south, not north. And that's when they realized, okay, this is not, this is not the way it was. Uh, we will continue on. And he was accused of being a butcher by some, but I think those were the weak-minded that didn't realize modern warfare is here. And this is what he it had is. His, he, he did have his one battle where he went at it a little harder than he should because uh, order. I, and I forget which battle it is. It Cold Harbor. Cold, Cold Harbor. Cold Harbor. It's, the, it's the one regret in his memoirs. He said, yeah. "I should not have ordered that last charge." Uh, he was he was outmatched. He should have known it. He did know it, but did it anyway. That's that. Well, that's at some one point, even somebody like system. Grant comes to start believing his own press. <laughs> <laughs> that's correct, and. Uh, I'll give him credit. He it, it, he didn't he did not uh, fall prey to that you know that so many people do that ego. Grant was a humble man uh, in and of himself. He was out for a mission. He was mission oriented. He was never it was never personal for him. Uh, in fact, uh, if he, if there was anything personal on it, in fact, he took the death of his men and the responsibilities that he had a little bit too personally. But that was because the man was at heart a compassionate man well, yes. instead of an egoist. And, you know, that is seen very much in uh, how he takes the surrender of enemies. You know, he, the U.S. famously stands for unconditional surrender, right. but it's not harsh terms that he imposes Mm-mm. No. Anywhere. You know, when, when Lee's army at the end is finally... Uh, uh, defeated and Lee surrenders to Grant, you would think that all these horrible things would happen, but they don't. No, that's right. Because Grant knows that there's no point because you got to put the country back together. Exactly. And it may not the be only... in his thinking throughout all of this, but as you say, he's compassionate. Mm-hmm. I think the only time he ever is... was really a, a unconditional surrender was at Donaldson, his first battle, and I think that was calculated on his part. Right. Well, was, yeah, he... you have to establish what. That's correct. What you are, but, but I think you've got the big stick. That even though they were the enemy, those those are still men. They still that's had to right. go home, take care of their families. And, and I think, in fact, it was that's at the heart of what goes on with how he deals with surrenders. Especially Vicksburg, in particular, was that right? A lot of people at the time criticized him, saying, "Why didn't you take?" them and put them as prisoners. Wouldn't that have been the smarter thing? And Grant was very clear. He says, no. And Rollins, his aide, is the one that kind of pushed him to it because his first temper was to take them all prisoner. But he realized after the fact, here's the strategic Grant. It's better to send these 30,000 men home whipped to all the towns and hamlets Mm -hmm. throughout the South to tell everybody that U.S. Grant and the federal government whipped our asses at Vicksburg. That's got a far more powerful and potent message than taking these guys and putting them into uh, federal uh, prisons. Well, and it would have taken months, and he wanted to remain on the move. That's correct. Yeah, the logistics of of all that, uh, they would be horrible today. Back then would have been so unbelievably complicated, and it would have stalled the war for a year in – uh, in the in the West, because you got to deal with those men, you got to figure out where to put them, where to house them, how to feed them, right? And this yeah. is still in what is essentially enemy territory. Yeah, yeah. Folks, he was needed more. at Chattanooga. I mean, he really would have. He was really needed at Chickamauga, but that was not possible. It was just too right. soon afterwards. And of course, they didn't realize uh, Rosecrans was still. He hadn't really been defeated yet. Of course, Chickamauga was an epic defeat, uh, and things got pretty wicked after that. And then Grant comes in and whoosh, saves the day again. Uh, uh, in many respects, we talk about his masterpiece of Vicksburg, and it is, but Chattanooga also is one, too. It's just – it pales in the light of Vicksburg because Vic, – you have to understand, and, Ro, uh, and Martin, you talked about this, Vicksburg is a campaign – it starts yeah. in like November of 62, yeah. but it no, no. doesn't really get 
going because he, he farts around, tries all sorts of things, and can't make anything work. He tries yeah, canals and here, stuff like that. Yeah. And it, it's really... Vicksburg, yeah, the campaign for Vicksburg started then, but really, it goes back farther. It goes oh, back... Oh, yeah, absolutely. To, you know, That's Grant's campaign. It's all yeah. one campaign. Just like Lincoln says it is all one country, Yeah. <laughs> it is all one campaign yeah. for him. Yeah, because yeah, as soon as Shiloh's over with, basically Shiloh, all that stuff that happened at Shiloh becomes the Vicksburg campaign. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's just basically where they were. They, were, they crossed the river at Shiloh and never go back again until the Vicksburg campaign. Because it's pretty key, too, that all these guys are Westerners. Lincoln's a Westerner. That's correct. Grant's from Ohio. You know, Sherman's from Ohio. These guys are Westerners. They split, uh, Grant and Lincoln spend time in Illinois. They understand how key the Mississippi is to the whole region. Right. It's, you know, that's to me, that might be a little overplayed about, you know, Lincoln, because he was on a flatboat as a kid and all this, and so he knows, he knows because he's a smart guy who lived in Illinois. Yeah. Um, well, from Kentucky. You know, spent time in Kentucky, Indiana, and Illinois for for his whole life before he goes uh, east to Washington. So yeah, he understands the the importance not just uh, socially because it's how you get around in that area, but yep. it, it truly is the economic lifeblood because it's how things get to and from one place to another. Yes. And you gotta remember, just like today, all major cities are on major rivers. It's mm -hmm. less important today, but it was imperative then. Yeah, that's right. No because highways. all the bulk stuff gets there via via waterway, and from there it's the trains that take it inland. Uh, yeah. You have to conquer both, uh, and, and which is what you know Vicksburg was both of those things. And uh, that's why that's Nashville was so important. That's exactly that's exactly right. That's well, that's why Shiloh. That's why they were fighting against in Shiloh was to get to Corinth, was because it was one of those railroad hubs. Uh, and, uh, that's why they, Kentucky not going to the Confederacy was so extremely important because of that Louisville Nashville link too. That's mm -hmm. correct. It would have been a yep. very big, big difference. Because Louisville is a huge, it, well, was, it's not as much anymore, but was a huge rail center. Mm -hmm. And, and so sea, too, uh, water. Gonna, wow. Oh, sorry, Francis. No, 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 go ahead. I stepped on you. Um, I'm going to interrupt for a second, and let's talk bourbon real quick before we go on. Oh, absolutely. So I broke open the old tub, and I have to say it's pretty, pretty awesome. That's what I'm drinking as well. Is the old tub, the unfiltered? Yeah. Uh, it's uh, it, what we, we were talking about this beforehand. Mature is one of the words that I used for it. Uh, it's got that. Um, it's a, there's a rough cut to it. Uh, it's it's, but it's it's got a bite and a burn, but in a good well, way. But it's uh, the burn's way down here though. It's not in your throat. It's way way kind of down. Yeah. Uh, and it's mild burn. Yeah. Uh, but it's it's just it's got kind of a meaty flavor is the way I. Uh, That's another word. Yes, exactly. Yeah. It's sort of I've not had a chance to try it yet. So uh, I think we did talk about this in the last episode because I think one of you had had the. Um, uh, well, I guess it would have been Francis because you just opened your bottle, Martin. Uh, right. Yeah. I had, had, uh, I had this time. Yeah. So uh, and I think you had agreed, but uh, Martin, what about you? Do you agree that this is the uh, uh, hundred proof uh, Basil Hayden? Does it fit that description? It's mighty good. It's mighty good. Now, it, it differs from like a Knob Creek in that I don't get the maple syrup from it that sure. I do from Knob Creek, which I do really like. Um, so, again, it's, it's, it, it, it does have a very big flavor, though. Nice yeah. and big. No cough. No... Uh, <laughs> yeah. I like the burn that is deep. Yeah. It's, it's way up underneath the diaphragm, you know. So yeah, it's, it's, yeah, that's uh, good. Yeah, it's a good drinking well, stuff. I think it's a hit for Beam. They need to leave it out. Um, so I've got plenty of it for for when we can gather here at Studio M. Uh, of course, we've got a bullet to too. So we're gonna crack the bullet then. And uh, so, listeners, yes, we're still recording uh, online for right now in the middle of uh, pandemic land here. Yes, but, uh, uh, and I, I fear we're getting to the point where we won't be able to anyways because. I fully expect a second lockdown uh, as opposed to the semi-opened economy that we have currently. Yeah. Well, it would not surprise know. me to see a second one. Uh, now, as far as bourbon goes, because I've not talked about mine, 
Uh, I almost went with the double oaks tonight, but um, I'm running a little bit low on that, so I decided to save it and went to the Devil's Cut, which ah. I think is always a good bourbon for warfare. Oh, uh, <laughs> very good. Very clever, sir. I like yeah. that. That's very good. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, we've talked about it before. Um, it's, it's harsher in the sense that I mean, it's, not, it's not nearly that mature, smooth flavor uh, that like a Woodford Double Oaked or the Basil Hayden or the, the Old Tub is going to be. Uh, but it's still a very good bourbon. Uh, I like it very much. When you want something that's uh, going to hit you a little bit sooner uh, than later, uh, it's burning a little bit higher, uh, but it's not like it's not one that's going to make you cough. So it still has its smoothness. Um, and it's not my it's not my all time favorite. Wouldn't be my first choice. That's always my wood for double oaked. But uh, uh, I go back to this on occasion because uh, mm -hmm. it's uh, it's a very good change uh, for uh, for variety's sake. Sounds like we're all three having uh, big flavor bourbon today. Well, it. Uh, Ulysses says Grant deserves nothing less. I mean, <laughs> come on. He's, uh, uh, when it comes to heroes, and of course, he's one of our first and one of our best. I mean, we still, I, we can't say enough good things about him. And uh, I'm one of those people, uh, you know, I don't want to hear anybody criticize the man because, you know, I punch your lights out, metaphorically speaking, of course, mm -hmm. because uh, he really was that good man and that great leader uh, that so oftentimes in history we don't get. Uh, we always need, though. So uh, I'm I'm a I'm a big believer in in how he goes about things. And Vicksburg is it's it's his piece de resistance. It's his masterpiece. Uh, it's not the only one. He has many, but uh, it's one that people look to because it's still studied in military campaigns. It's I mean in, well, in military sc strategy schools. It's still studied it's, in business schools. One of the interesting things about Vicksburg, and I think this is true for. Um, uh, a good deal of the battles in, in the Civil War uh, is it's either the first of its kind or the last of its kind. And before I go into that, Martin uh, is holding up a book, and the Shelby Foote book they had, had earlier, so I get the impression he wants to say something. Yes, yes. Before we continue on about Vicksburg, I was just going to, real quick, in addition to our little bourbon endorsement, mention you guys have talked about the Shelby Foote, star, uh, Shelby Foote stars in their courses, so that one is Gettysburg. Right. Um, but if you also, we strongly recommend not only that Grant miniseries, but I strongly recommend any Bruce Catton book. He's yes. written about Grant yes. a great deal. Yes. You're, you're a big fan of him more so than the, the rest of us, yeah. Yes. He's, he's, um, well, I mean, he's, he's nearly as lyrical a writer uh, as Shelby Foote. Shelby Foote, of course, has kind of that, that southern voice. Maybe a little bit more of the poetry in his in his writing, but Catton's pretty close. I mean, he is a Pulitzer Prize winner. They're so. they're similar approaches. They're both narratives. Uh, unlike, say, Ron Chernow, who does a fantastic, fantastic Grant biography. It's the most recent one, and he was actually appeared on the Grant miniseries as one of the advisors. It was based on his book, which is the most recent. But my God. Uh, he's been talked about so many times. He even wrote his own memoirs, which we've talked about before, yep. which are highly readable even today. Uh, and it's not just an apology or a detailed who went where and what. It the man's voice comes through, just like Shelby Foote's comes through, like Bruce Catton's come through. Yep. And when you can hear the writer's voice, it's a better read. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Well, you know, uh, there are so many good authors uh, when it comes to the Civil War. Shelby Foote is, is obviously one of the great stars. Catton is as well. Uh, so many others that uh, from from uh, from the U.S. that are, are fantastic. I don't think there's a whole lot of non-U.S. writers that cover our, our Civil War, but uh, he's did. really fantastic writers uh, that cover it. So what I was talking about with, the, about with battles in the Civil War, um, it's either the first of its kind or the last of its kind. And Vicksburg is has both element, both of these elements, which is one of the reasons why I think it's fascinating for me. So, as I mentioned earlier, it's probably uh, the the best first example of trench warfare, uh, the, as we would think about it today, where there are true trench works dug uh, around the city, mm -hmm. and that just really had not been seen in that fashion. Uh, besieging armies did not usually have them because prior to uh, modern times, and I'll, I'll count 
um, Civil War still is relatively modern in terms of warfare. Uh, cities were behind these huge walls uh, if, there, if there was a siege. So trenches really did not come into play. And because uh, it was very easy to, you know, stay beyond on, beyond range of the, uh, the the guns in the in the city. But what's interesting is that it is also probably one of, uh, out, well, it's not the last. It's one of the last because we still have um, Petersburg coming up. Uh, but it is one of the last sieges of a city. The Civil War is really one of the last times we see that in warfare because. You know, when you look at the wars that happened between it and today, they're modern wars in the sense that men move very fast with very devastating weapons. Um, the Spanish-American War, there really wasn't, it was so short, there really wasn't time for that. It was, it was a lot more Navy and very short land actions uh, as opposed to something like the Civil War. And, of course, World War I, it was all land, but it was all very quick, uh, very mechanized, and World War II was even, even more so. You didn't besiege cities. You either bombed the hell out of them or shot the hell out of them with your guns. Yeah. I mean, um, Stalingrad and Leningrad, I mean, really that's the next time cities are besieged in the same way that Vicksburg and Petersburg are. Right. And and even those are are probably unique in, because of uh, various things. One, uh, you've got the time of the year that is going to be an issue uh, for uh, besiegers. In those, you've also got the fact that uh, the um, the Nazis in those are at the very end of an extreme supply line. Yeah, uh, and that also affects their ability to to successfully wage a siege, like we would think of it. So, th- to me, that those are the same, but there's also a lot of unique things about them. Um, yeah. So you guys have, have brushed on a couple of things about this campaign that. I want to explore in a little bit more depth because it it goes to that that character of Grant, that whole thing where he did pretty much what nobody else would have done. And like I said, this is this is a campaign that's going on for months. Grant's supply line and his 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 whole force is based around Memphis, mm-hmm. and so the drive on Vicksburg is coming from north. It's coming from Tennessee. But north of Vicksburg in Mississippi is a mess. That's right. It's, it's swampland. Swampland. It's wet. It's a mess. And so this most direct route, this just go, okay, let's just go south from Memphis isn't really working. It's it's a huge disaster. And they're trying all kinds of stuff. They're trying to dig canals and they're trying to, you know, go through these winding rivers and this flat land in Mississippi. You know, that's a great thing to, that you brought out. This is one of the things that um, people are going to have a hard time picturing because the first thing you think of is, well, why did he have to do that? Why didn't he just go to the other side of the river, come around or stay on that side and do sweeping around? Well, if you look at the map and you look at the detail, the Mississippi is massive. And I don't mean just the width of the river. The tributaries that come off of it yeah. are still considered part of the Mississippi River. It's interesting. I, I did not know this until recently, but uh, so much of that is considered federal uh, navigable waterways uh, because of the, it being the Mississippi River. Even stuff that goes deep into the state, you know, relatively speaking, you would not even think, well, this is part of the Mississippi. And so what we would think is pretty massive today would have been huge. You know, you can't move 70 or 80,000 men mm-hmm. across that easily. That's right. Well, you know, be on both sides of the river. Exactly. So if you were to go deep, far deep. enough out to go around it, who knows what would have happened to the, to the Confederate Army there. Now, they probably couldn't have left because they had to defend the city, but, you know, you, run a, you ran a severe chance of, Johnson being able to get his forces in if he doesn't keep an eye on them. That's why he, he has to defeat them. Uh, the topography plays a huge part in how this battle went and the preparation to so. it. Yeah. So, yeah, the, the Yazoo Delta feeding into a Mississippi total mess, all swampland, yep. very windy, bendy, 
Again, they try all sorts of stuff. They try on the other side. They try on the Arkansas side and the Louisiana side, trying to find some way to, uh, to get to Vicksburg. And as Robert, as you mentioned, it sits on high bluffs over the Mississippi. Everything can be seen. They've got gun emplacements in it. Mm -hmm. So what Grant finally does is he just pretty much says, forget about Memphis. Forget about my supply line. I'm going to have the Navy take some gunboats and just run south of the river. And we're going to cross below Vicksburg. Mm -hmm. Significantly below. Yes. And then we're going to be on the same side of the river as the rebels on dry land. Because exactly. South of Vicksburg, that was critical. It's not swampy. That was the big key. So it's, it's this whole... Again, this thing that nobody else would have done. Mm -hmm. Well, he was told not to. Yeah. The everybody, everybody opposed it. They said they'll blow us out of the water. <laughs> and know, they, not, but they didn't. Not only is he the bulldog who won't let go, but he's willing to do the thing that seems inconceivable. Supplies? Eh. So he wires Halleck, I think, and he says, hey, you won't hear from me for a few days. <laughs> basically and and that's it he's 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 off the grid you going on vacation what's going on <laughs> well april 16th is probably the big day other than the actual surrender day because that's when grant finally decides we're going to run the freaking gauntlet and yeah. he said 11 p.m in the middle of the night with uh all these union gunboats uh with filled with cotton and uh, whatever they can do to muffle the sound, they're going with the current downstream in the middle of the night. Of course, you know, the Confederates, they get word of this. They're starting lighting fires on the side of the, of the banks, and they start firing at them. And this is where the real genius of Grant comes in, in the fact that Grant is not a one-man, one-trick pony or one-man show. Admiral David Porter is in charge of this, and he's, he's in full command of, of the actual gunboat placements. He discovers during this process, the Confederates are overshooting them. They're shooting their smokestacks, but they're never hitting the actual boats. So he orders his men to move close to the Vicksburg side. The guns can't go down that close. They can't bend yeah. that far down. And yeah, the well, whole flotilla high. makes it past that night. Yeah. And all of a sudden, that which could not be done was done. Yeah. And, and, that's and a without key, a, that's another, key. Another key thing for Grant that we... Uh, He's willing to work with others. Correct. And Very much so. For another Union general to have a close relationship with the Admiral and the Navy and, and this kind of this notion of this combined arm, something that would come – I mean, there's a reason that it's called the Joint Chiefs of Staff now, <laughs> you know, because we, we understand warfare has to be a, create, a, a, a coordinated effort. You coordinate all your resources. That's right. Back then, they didn't, they didn't get this. Grant's no. really the first guy really doing this. Ego always got in the way, uh, especially <laughs> well, once you reach a certain level. And when you think about it, the whole idea that you're going to have an admiral of your Navy that far in your interior commanding the, this flotilla, it, on its face, would seem absurd. Because what admiral would even want to do that? Because admirals are for the, the, the deep water ships. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know? yeah, open ocean guys. So yeah, they're they're blue water guys. So that in itself is pretty amazing that that uh, Porter is there and and you know also willing to work with Grant. Yeah, well, he, I think he, he saw the vision. He believed in Grant. He yeah. saw he understood the vision here and he recognized we have to take some long we have to take risks. We have to take some long chances, uh, confident in the fact that we will prevail because we're you know we're, we're buttoned up. We've we've got the full support together here, and once he gets those boats down down below the city, it's very easy to ferry all of his thirty thousand for forty thousand troops onto dry land, and that's when the real overland campaign begins because he's yeah. on the same side. That's when he goes north. He could have gone to Vicksburg like we've talked about already, and doesn't. He goes kind of a halfway point between Jackson, the city of Jackson, and, and Vicksburg turns around, smacks the dog snot out of uh, Joe Johnston, uh, turns around, beats Pemberton out in the field at Champion Hill, and next thing you know, he's besieging the city. 
Uh, he's got right. trenches on both sides, too, just in case yes. Johnston comes. He's got the plan. He's prepared. And but he brings in these huge guns and just blows the snot at him. I love the, I love the colorful metaphors I'm using today, guys. Sorry. <laughs> but it, well, you know, the interesting thing about the, the siege is it is still not a – it's still not a modern siege or modern taking of a city like we would think of it today. Um, it's, it's kind of a mix because there's still a lot of waiting it out because Grant knows he doesn't really have to destroy the city to win because he controls the river at this point mm-hmm. and he controls the land around it. They'll eventually run out of food. Yeah. And, and, yeah. Star and, the and, the complete, the, and, and it does get pretty dicey. Uh, you know, the, oh, yeah. the, all the, the cats and dogs disappear by the end of this. Oh, the rats, too. That's and right. The rats they, they too, read yeah. anything. There was only, they, they estimate there are about 2,000 civilians at this point in the city. Uh, now, that's, of course, in addition to the 30,000 defenders uh, that are there. And it gets, uh, uh, he pounds them to dust. He doesn't, he's not just content with let's sit here and starve them out. He's going to make life absolutely miserable well, yes, for them. That's my point, though. The city is not destroyed. He doesn't pound them to dust. He's continually uh, shelling them, yes, because that's part of his, his strategy. To, yeah, to, to break their will, but break not, to break the city, not to break the city. That's correct. Yeah. I want to make sure. Yeah, he's, the city is not destroyed. It's not in great shape. Right. But it's not like he has to march in to yeah. the city and you know, pillage and loot like a, a normal siege would end in prior to this time. Because again, that's part of him. That's not the way he's going to do that. Yeah, he's never going to do that. And he was. And the surrender terms he gave uh, were amazingly generous, as we've talked about. Yeah. Uh, Pemberton comes forth, and he's you know, what are your terms? And Grant at first it says, no, ain't no terms. It's unconditional surrender. And Rollins, his aide, says, General, we can't do that. Let's talk about what do they want. He says, fine. You know, what do you want? He says, well, we want to leave with our personal property. He says, okay. Uh, horses, sidearms, but no slaves. And of course, Pemberton says, well, what do you mean no slaves? He says, you just heard me. No slaves. They stay. That's what they were wanting. Right. And uh, that's, that was, in many respects, that was the biggest defeat. It was not just the defeat of the city. It was the defeat of the Confederate way of life, well, which he nails right then and, and he, there. Well, in those he was terms. Taking, it's a logical conclusion yep. to the Emancipation Proclamation. Yep. That's he correct. He could which not has, let them go. It would have been not just immoral. It would have been illegal, uh, in, in a sense, because they were freed people. Uh, That's exactly right, because it, this, is, cause this is July 3rd, 1863. As of June, January 1st, the Emancipation Proclamation was in full force and effect. All slaves were free in the, in the Confederate territories. Right. So, you know, Grant's so, just simply taking that to its logical extension. He is. Now, the interesting thing, uh, Martin, do you have, because I'm going to go a little bit past this with a little bit of some anecdotal humor. Uh, anything you want to because I'm sure there's more about the battle that you would like to add in here, because mine can wait to the end. Uh, no, well, I was just going to add, you know, you were talking about the, the condition of the city uh, and the civilians. I think it was the uh, Ken Burns special that mentions at one point they're, pre, they're so hard up they're ripping newspaper off the wall to print, uh, or they're, they're taking wallpaper down off the walls of the houses to print the city newspaper. Wow. So that's you know that was the the how rough a shape the city was in, but uh, no, go ahead, man, go ahead. So, Good stuff. Um, this is this is anecdotal and it's probably not entirely true, but it could be. But it, even if it's not, it represents the the southern mindset, um, because even though the union was maintained, uh, it was a union in name, but not necessarily in fact after the war for many many years. Mm-hmm. and the South considered themselves a conquered people, um, whether that was rightly or, or justly done or not. So when it comes time for the Spanish-American War, and there is a, a scene in a, a movie about that, about Teddy Roosevelt's Rough Riders, and Gary Busey is oh, a yeah. senator from Mississippi. And he talks really? about, he's talking to the president, and he talks about how uh, he will go ahead and raise a regiment because they, they, that's the way they still raised armies at this point. They, they look, go home locally and, and raise them. He will raise a regiment to fight in the Spanish-American War. And he says, you know, we don't celebrate the 4th of July in 
the South. But he was from Mississippi. We know where he meant we don't celebrate the 4th of July. Yeah. But after this, we just might start. Uh, so it, to me, that, that was such a, a poignant and, and great illustration. Whether it's true or not doesn't matter because it, it's, you know, as Dan Rather might say, it has truthiness to it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it sounds like we think it ought to be true. Yeah. Um, a but, bit of folklore. but, you know, it really, I think it does capture that mindset that even though the, the war was eventually was won in no small part due to Vicksburg, which the actual surrender took place on July 4th. So it's no wonder the South, especially Mississippi, did not celebrate the 4th of July for some you know, 40, 50 years uh, after that, uh, maybe longer, who knows. Uh, but it's, it, I just find it, it, that was just such a great, I think, such a great illustration that even though the war was successful, it was successful on the surface because we know that the South didn't truly consider itself a part of the Union for decades. Mm -hmm. uh, Generations, really. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's, that's what it took for that to change. Uh, and, that, and the galvanization that took place in, like you said, in the Spanish-American War somewhat, World War I and particularly World War II. By yeah. the time that's happened, uh, things are different, although they're not completely different because the specter of racism still, still is out there. Uh, right, uh, but as far as being part of the United States, uh, it, it's, right. it's more true in the beginning of the 20th century than it is at the end. Amen. Yeah. Um, well, the last Confederate veteran, I think, dies in 1959, if I recall correctly. Uh, and that, and but you still got. It, it takes three generations for things like that to really remove themselves from the collective consciousness. We, as as a as a human species, we can remember about th uh, two generations backwards and two generations forwards. But well, by the time right, we, we get past that, we can that, relate to the life our grandparents led, but right. not our great grandparents. That's exactly right. We can do three. Most of us will know our grandchildren, although with medical advances, many of us will know our great grandchildren, and some may even get to know their great great grandchildren. Right. But even so, because of the age difference, really the grandchildren will be the last. That That's correct. The, the stories that we tell and the attitudes we have and the prejudices we hold can only transmit itself about three generations before they're – it's like the game of telephone. You know, you used to play as a kid, tell the same story around the room, and it gets very different by the end. Uh, once it goes yeah, through the generational think, filter, things are different. I think almost all of us, while we are all – at many times embarrassed at our parents and what they say and do, mm -hmm. we are even more embarrassed, but in a different way about our grandparents. Um, at times, yes. And there, I think it's 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 less directly about you know, oh my God, look what my parents did. They have embarrassed me because of my you know teenager, or, you know, early twenties or whatever. Um, but when we come to our grandparents, because the culture changes. Mm -hmm. And certainly the 20th century has changed so quickly. Um, anything much beyond our parents, you know, we're embarrassed not only at what they might say or do, or we think, oh, that's so old-fashioned, as it seems like we've become embarrassed of what they thought and what they were. Unfortunately, that is true yeah. in many respects. Uh, it shouldn't be monolithic because they weren't no. always that. Uh, because they, you know, their uh, our, our grandparents' generation was called the greatest generation for many good reasons. But uh, like Trevor Slatter, we would say, you know, he always pops in. It's complicated. It's uh, very complicated. Well, hey, hey. but I mean, the, the point of that, you know, without getting into anything else, was essentially that why that does take into the early 20th century before the South really reintegrates with the Union. Uh, I don't mean integration racially. I'm talking about politically, yeah. uh, conscious, socially conscious of it. Um, the, the lost cause, uh, the whole lost cause idea was an attempt to push back at that inevitability, I think. They yes, were trying that to, really is an early 20th century invention. That's right. They realized, oh, maybe we're going invention. to become union again, and we don't like that. So those of us who are of age and in power will create this narrative to forestall or hopefully derail that, which, of course, it doesn't happen. In fact, they're the ones that look to be uh, – the monsters in many ways, even more so than those, than the Civil War generation themselves, because they're a little bit more insidious. As we now, a hundred years later, 
are finding out because Confederate monuments and things like that are all coming down around us. And many of us are just now realizing, yeah, those shouldn't be there. Why are we, why are we uh, revering that? You put up a statue, that's, yeah. that's, a re that's something to revere. And I don't know if it was the Joint Chief, Chief of Staff or if it was just the, the Chief of the Army, but just this week decreed that Confederate flags and stuff is no longer allowed on U.S. Army bases. Which kind of Think breaks the question is, where the heck were – they were Why? there already? Why? How, why did it have to happen? Because was that already there? Really? I think it was, had to go all the way to the Secretary of Defense. I think that was the – Secretary yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it was not, it was not a low-level decision that, that had to be decreed. And when you think about that, you know, we, we marvel at this constantly. We're the, we've got to be the only people to put up monuments to the losers in a civil war. Yeah. Let's go now. Yeah. And, and we do it on official government property. You know, we did it on military. We have military bases named after Confederate generals. That's right. Uh, at, at, which is just astounding in, in many ways. Uh, when you think about the logic of that, never mind the, the, the obvious offensive. That's, that should be obvious that those things would be offensive. Yeah. How do you get to that yeah. point logically? In a, you in a, you know, an attempt to smooth over even having them there, I guess, to begin with. You know, you have to establish yeah. the bases everywhere. You didn't want yeah, pushback was, from the state governments. You said, well, you know, as a SOP, we'll, we'll name it for Braxton Bragg. Yeah, it was a deal made. Uh, it was a deal made to keep the waters calm and the peace happening, because there was still this underlying uh, hatred, for lack of a better right. term, well, that was still know, out there. You know, things like Fort Hood, um, Fort Bragg. They didn't choose, you know, Fort Lee, or Fort Jackson, or Fort Davis. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, you know, uh, much less yeah. a Fort Longstreet. Uh, although that would have pissed off the Southerners even more um, after yeah. he went Republican. Well, um, at least there's no Fort Nathan Bedford Forest. True, true. Yeah, that that, that guy was a piece of work. Um, but still, though, you know, they didn't choose the, the 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 top leaders of the South, so they may have compromised to get them, but they still didn't let them go. Probably the ones they really wanted. Thank God. Yeah. yeah. One of the good things about history and the, the generational changes that ha happen is that we, we always have the re-opportunity constantly to repent and do better. And that's mm -hmm. what we're doing now. Our generation, which you could say that we as Generation Xers are the ones that are you know, in charge currently, our generation is, we were the ones that were there when we said enough. No, we're not going to do this. And uh, we didn't push back as a general rule. We said, yeah, this, is, this should have been changed long ago, and we've got the will to do it. And so it is. So shall it be written, so shall it be done, as they say. Uh, that, that fills me with pride, you know, that it happened on our watch. Uh, well, I, I think it – I don't know I would say it would happen on our watch necessarily. Obviously, none of us are involved in those decisions, so I don't mean that. Um, but you know, a lot of this is forced from a from a grassroots level, um, sure, from absolutely. from our children's generation. Granted, we are oh, the yeah, ones that have to make it happen. In, in right. That sense. Oh yeah, that, uh, a lot of people deserve a lot of credit because it takes large numbers of the public will to make anything like this happen, and the the winds that are blowing are very much, you know, self evident, as Jefferson would say. Uh, well, you know, I'm glad you bring that up because I'd like to re reiterate a point that we made. Um, although Martin, I think, was going to say yeah, something. Martin was going to say something. No, you, go ahead, bro. Go ahead. So, um, you know, I, I made the point in one of our more recent episodes, and I don't remember which one it was, that no, we are not a perfect country. No country is perfect. But we are always striving to get better. Yeah. It may take a step forward and a couple steps back before we start taking three or four more steps forward. It's not a straight line path. But I think as a country, we do try more and more as time goes by to live up to those words that Jefferson and Adams and Franklin put in the Declaration of Independence. And that is that we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Mm -hmm. And you can argue that 
those three men, especially Jefferson, didn't believe that, that uh, black men and women were, were equal or that women were equal. That's not the point. What they said, whether they realized it or not, has eternal significance. That's right. And it is an ideal that we all look, look to, to live up to. Yeah. People like Grant made it more possible to live up to that because yep. it took a war to do it, but we did eventually as a country write a great evil. Now, mm -hmm. we didn't write it perfectly, obviously, uh, but I think as time goes on, we're, we're trying. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, I think that does get lost too often uh, in some of the rhetoric. Mm -hmm. Well, Ken Burns said it very, very well in his Civil War thing. He says, at least in law, the Civil War changed this. And that's one of the reasons why it, it begs us to go back and study it, uh, both the personalities and the events and the motivations behind all this, because it, it has to start with law. It does. Society, society can't change until that happens. Uh, yeah, that's, some people that's, say that's, that you have to change the hearts and minds before you change the law. Totally disagree. I think, yeah. that that, I think history proves that wrong. That's right. I Civil War is a great example that of that. The Civil Rights Act is a great example of that. Uh, the yeah. hearts and minds only changed once the law changed because the law is a teacher. Uh, it has to be, uh, especially generational like we're talking about. It takes yeah. – by the time uh, the two, two generations – you know, we were, we were not even born – when the Civil Rights Act was, was passed. We were just, you know, just a year or two out of it. So our children and their children have a very different understanding of race than our parents and grandparents did because of that moment in law. Yeah. And, I, and that's a, a great thing. Law is, even though American law is, has more in common with English law than it does Roman law, right. all law has one thing that we take from Roman law, uh, and I don't mean the law of Rome, you know, they specifically how we approach the law. And the Romans approached the law as, and this is the way the church does as well, as we set the ideal. This is what we shoot for. That's right. And we know we're going to fall short, but that's why we have confession. I was talking about church law. And we, we know we're going to fall short, but we still want to shoot for that ideal. Uh, now, we still have some punitive aspects to it. Much of English law is based in punitive uh, uh, law. And, but it also, that punitive law is a reflection of, well, if you're going to fail those ideals, then we're going to punish you. Uh, so it's a much harsher way to view law. And there's probably, the only right way is probably a mix of those two things. But no matter what, there's that ideal. The law has to embody the ideals. If it doesn't, then we'll never shoot for that because we only shoot for what we have to. That's why the law has to come first. People won't change unless they, they have something better to change to. That's right. Yeah. And that's codifying it in law, uh, even though that looks very brute force and is very um, um, uh, 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 oh, impositional, perhaps? A no, hammer? clumsy. Clumsy sometimes. Clumsy, uh, oh, yes. Okay. Uh, it can be very clumsy in how we go about it. Uh, it can be done very ham-fisted, but eventually that ideal becomes the standard, and we all recognize it. Amen to that. Amen. So, listeners, I know I promised this was going to be a straight history episode. It was going to be just a lesson in history, but guess what? You're with snakes and otters. That's it right. It turned into philosophy and the law and... The human condition. human condition and all these other great things that it always does for us. So just to sum up again, Vicksburg is important because it's the fulfillment of the Anaconda plan. It splits the Confederacy in two. It separates Texas uh, from, from the east. Um, the breadbasket of the Confederacy, it's now going to be possible to starve Lee out. And Grant emerges as the winner, the guy who could win battles and win the war more than anybody else. Meade's just had a great victory in Pennsylvania, but he's not a bulldog. He's not going to grab Lee and keep going. Grant will. He's Lincoln's man. He comes east and wins the war. And that's the, that's the history lesson.
That's right. You so, can't talk about Vicksburg without Gettysburg. You can't talk about Gettysburg without Vicksburg because yeah. it's a one-two punch. Yeah, that's right. Uh, it really is. Perfectly. And one without the other, if, if the, the North had lost both, who knows how long the war would have gone on, uh, or if even it would have gone on because losing both might have meant Lincoln would have lost in 64. Yeah, yeah. But even if we had only won one of those, the war would have been won by the North. Winning both, to my mind, shortened the war considerably, even though some of the Definitely. bloodiest fighting was still to come. Uh, and, and not the bloodiest in terms of body count, but the bloodiest in terms of, almost in terms of slaughter. Uh, yeah, just because it, well, it's like, like we said, it, it becomes continuous. Once, yeah. once Grant moves east, the idea of we're not going to get a bloody nose and go home, uh, we, we've got a hold of a Lee now, we're not letting him go. It, it's right. And swimmer. once you've got a guy who will prosecute this war, it's much easier for Lincoln to make it stay a war about freeing the slaves, yep. uh, giving it that moral context. Because yep. let's face it, you know, even though probably most people in the U.S. could have cared less about freeing the slaves at that time, at least historically, it really does give it that moral patina that, that just preserving the Union does not. Yeah. One is a political decision. The other is a moral decision. Right. The moral decision has to trump the political decision. Correct. And yeah, Victor anybody that says otherwise has happened. got another agenda. <laughs> yes, uh, that's correct. Right. Uh, it's, it's always the moral has to come first. Yeah. Otherwise, the political is just self-serving. Yeah. What's the point of that? Well, it's almost always self-serving, but yes. yeah. Yeah, <laughs> self-serving for some uh, and not for others. Uh, but a moral is intended to be self-serving. It serves all. It's supposed to anyway. Yeah. Uh, I'll take the moral every time. So that's quite a wrap-up, guys. I, that's, uh, that's good stuff. What, what, what a wrap-up. So, Francis, that wraps up all four history episodes on the Civil War. Mm -hmm. So what is next week, though? We'll go back to Code of Honor next time, of course, uh, which is always our fun. Uh, we always have great quotations that we're going to play with. We really do go deep. We really do get into the human condition uh, and those moral questions uh, pretty deep on those Code of Honor episodes. So uh, uh, join us next week uh, as Robert once again is the hammer to uh, our, <laughs> uh, Martin and my anvil as we come back and bring this together again. Thanks for being with us here every week at Snakes and Otters, a pointless discussion of eternal questions. Be sure to spread the word on your social media accounts. Follow us and retweet us. We are on Instagram and on Twitter at Snakes and Otters. Let your friends know that they can find us on Podbean, Spotify, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, Apple Podcasts, and on YouTube. Just search Snakes and Otters Podcast to find us. And please, remember to leave us your comments and reviews. It helps people find us. And you can always send us an email at snakesandotterspodcast at gmail.com. I'm Martin. I'm Robert. And I'm Francis. Catch us next week. Same snake time, same otter channel.